All right, welcome everybody. Maybe we can give a couple a minute or two and let people join and um maybe start it in um, two minutes or so. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, um, we're excited to um, have you here for the um, ISHLT Pediatrics Professional Community Webinar. My name is Dr. Kyle Hope. I'm a pediatric heart failure and transplant cardiologist at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. I'll be one of the moderators for this session. And I'm Carol Conrad. I'm the program director of the Pediatric Lung Transplant Program um at Stanford Children's Health. Um, we're excited to bring together our community and talk about a pretty challenging topic, transplantation in children with marginal pulmonary vasculature. Um, we'll start the presentation we'll start with the presentation of a um a challenging clinical case and hear from each of our three experts uh, before finishing with the discussion. Um, so without further ado, I'd, I'm excited to present our first speaker, Dr. Mel uh, Melody Lynn. Um, Dr. Lynn completed her undergraduate at Baylor University before obtaining both her Doctor of Medicine and Master of Science degrees from University of North Texas Health Science Center. She subsequently completed her pediatrics residency training at Emory School of Medicine before returning to Texas for her fellowship training. Um, she completed her fellowship in pediatric cardiology at Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine, and we've been delighted to have her as our fourth year fellow um, this year in, um, for advanced heart failure and cardiomyopathy training. Um, so thanks, Mel, for joining us today. Um, we're excited to um, hear about uh, the case. Thank you, Kyle, for that introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay, so I'd like to thank the ISHLT uh, Pediatric Committee for inviting me to share our patient with um, for this webinar, and I look forward to a great conversation. Okay, so to start off, uh, our patient was diagnosed prenatally with pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect, right aortic arch, and major arterial pulmonary collateral arteries. She had one large collateral from her left subclavian artery supplying the entire left lung and two collaterals in the right lung, uh, going to the right lung, one supplying the right middle and right lower lobe and one small supplying the a lower portion of her lower right lobe. She underwent partial unifocalization of two larger collaterals um, and a 3.5 millimeter left modified BTT shunt at two weeks of age. This was followed by complete repair at nine months of age, consisting of a VSD closure, 10 millimeter RV to PA conduit placement, and new focalization of the remaining right collateral. She also underwent extensive patch augmentation of her pulmonary arteries, and her PFO was left open as a pop off for elevated RV pressures. She did have significant postoperative low cardiac output syndrome, requiring a delayed sternal closure six days later. So she remained cyanotic with saturations in the low 80s and required supplemental oxygen at two years 
She, she developed worsening signs of right ventricular hypertension and moderately depressed RV function and was referred to Texas Children's for further pulmonary vasculature re rehabilitation in our cath lab. So she underwent multiple interventional procedures with balloon angioplasty of the pulmonary arteries in her RV to PA conduit. So her first procedure was at five years and, or sorry, two years and five months. And um, so at that time, her RV pressures were three fourths systemic. And so she underwent angioplasty of her proximal left pulmonary artery and multiple branches of her right pulmonary artery. She had drastic improvement in her systemic saturation from 70% during the middle of the case on room air to high 90s after conclusion of all of her angioplasties. She had returned to the cath lab for further intervention five months later and had, um, at that time, her RV pressures were half systemic, so it had some improvement. And she underwent further angioplasty of multiple distal branches of her pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery, and a right uh, RV to PA conduit. Uh, this intervention resulted in successful recanalation of a previously completely occluded branch supplying her entire right lower and middle lobes. And she did sustain a reperfusion pulmonary edema to the right upper lobe, which she remained hospitalized for several days. Afterwards, she had been weaned down to a fourth liter uh, a nasal cannula for supplementation with oxygen sats in the low 90s. And she had her final intervention at three years and one month, uh, which um, again, her RV pressures at that time were half systemic. She did have a PVR um, at 5.8 Woods unit. And she had placement of bifurcating stents uh, within the right pulmonary artery branches and her ASD was closed at that time. Her saturations at baseline were 89% on room air and at the end of the case, they were high mm -hmm. 90s on room air. She was weaned off supplemental oxygen and was doing well uh, with good energy at home. And since pictures are worth a thousand words, we're gonna go through some of her angiography. She wanted, I mean, the CD, so oh, this, Hey, Mindy, can you mute? Min Mindy, okay. can you mute yourself? Thanks. Okay, so this is a cine of her pulmonary vasculature. So you see that her, her left um, branch PA is quite dilated compared to her right system. The, there is a hyperplastic RPA in her, and, and also bilateral underdevelopment of her distal pulmonary vasculature bed. And we'll show you some still frames of that images as well. So again, you can see proximal stenosis of her RPA and LPA, and then the dilation of her, her more distal LPA. And then you can see distal hypoplasia of multiple segments of her right system, and then underdevelopment of the distal vascular bed. So nine months after her last intervention, her mother noticed decreasing activity, poor appetite, facial swelling, and abdominal swelling. Her mother requested her routine appointment for her cardiologist to be moved up. And so in clinic, she was tachypnic and her liver was palpated four centimeters below her right costar margin. As you can see, there's a drastic contrast in her ventricular function over the three month period. In June, her right ventricle, as you can see here, was severely dilated with moderately to severely depressed function, which had been her baseline. Her LV had normal size um, and mildly depressed function with an EF calculated at 50%. This contrast to the September echo, you can see that both her um, ventricles are now severely dilated with severely depressed by ventricular function with an EF calculated of 15%. She was admitted to our ICU for inotropic initiation and evaluation for the significant change in her function. Her cardiac MRI demonstrated no myocardial edema or scarring suggestive of myocarditis. She did have severely dilated RV with an end diastolic volume of 248 milliliters per meter squared and an EF of 13% and a severely dilated RLV with an end diastolic volume of 186 milliliters per meter square and an EF of 16%. She also had coronary angiography, demonstra which demonstrated normal anatomy with no areas of stenosis or luminal irregularities. So the patient proved to be Miller-Known dependent. 
our team thought she was a poor candidate for isolated cardiac transplantation due to her RV hypertension with RV dysfunction, elevated PVR, hypophosic PAs, and poorly developed pulmonary vascular bed. She was a potential heart-lung transplant, though her history of congenital heart disease with pulmonary hypertension and young age portend worse outcomes. And overall, there's a low median survival for all pediatric heart-lung transplantation reported. I'll pause here and we can come back to the patient towards the tail end of the webinar. Keep this patient in mind as you think about how your center may approach this patient as we hear from some of the experts in this population. Thanks, Mel. It was a fantastic presentation of the case. If there are no questions, we will proceed to Dr. Rebecca Kameny's discussion about the MCS considerations for this patient. Dr. Kameny came to us at Stanford Children's Health in 2016 after finishing her pediatric critical care fellowship at UCSF. Current she, currently, she attends on the cardiovascular intensive care unit as a physician on the pulmonary hypertension service um, and started that consult service as well and is co-director for the Center for Advanced Lung Therapies or CEAL since January 2022. The SEAL program is a multidisciplinary collaborative program to support children to lung transplant with bridge to transplant therapies or palliative cardiac surgery for patients with severe lung disease or pulmonary hypertension. Take it away, Rebecca. Thank you, Carol, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to present. Um, so, uh, the title of my talk, as you can see, is uh, Bridging Strategies and What MCS Options Are Available for the Failing Subpulmonary Ventricle. I'll admit I was taken a little off guard by the presentation that uh, this patient has biventricular failure. Uh, so take, uh, take some of the options that I'm presenting with a grain of salt that this patient may indeed need more support. Um, so when talking even about just the subpulmonary ventricle, there's really so much that we could go into. You can see at the far right image, we could talk about the systemic RV um, and SVADs as they're termed, or BIVADs, um, as you see with the two Berlin devices there, and there's a number of things. I'm really just going to focus on right ventricular failure and kind of a two ventricle circulation as our patient has. Um, this, this patient, I didn't think the top uh, circle would be relevant, but it may in fact be quite relevant uh, that RV failure in LVAD is its own um, entity with lots of interesting discussion um, to be had, but I was going to focus actually on the two bottom circles of right ventricular failure with anatomic pulmonary artery disease, as we see in patients with MAP or pulmonary stenosis, and then right ventricular failure in pulmonary vascular disease or pulmonary hypertension. And the reason oh, I'm- Rebecca, making... sorry to interrupt. I don't think we're seeing you go through your slides. Oh, dear. It's just on the, the first slide. It's showing oh. the notes view. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. Now, are you seeing uh, just the slide? No, not yet. Hmm. Are you? I'm going to try to unplug and replug. I apologize about that. No worries. I'm also I'm showing to some colleagues in the room with me, uh, so that may be part of our issue. That's improving, but that's your presentation. You. All right. Well, they will miss out on my fantastic uh, slides, but but they'll. Um, all right. So now is it working on? Yeah. Great. We're in business. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, well, you missed these great graphics. <laughs> um, so as, as I was saying, you know, there's lots we could talk about, SFADs, BIVADs, et cetera, but I'm really going to focus on right ventricular failure in a 2V circulation. As I said, RV failure in patients with LVADs um, is a very interesting topic um, that I'm not going to spend too much time on today, but perhaps in the discussion we can get to it. Um, but rather talking about RV failure with 
an atomic PA disease as our patient has and all, as patients with MAPCAS have or those with PS and other anatomic considerations or right ventricular failure in pulmonary vascular disease or pulmonary hypertension. And the reason I'm really focusing on that distinction is that the pulmonary vasculature is inherently different and the types of support that these patients can tolerate is at least classically considered to be different. So in a patient who has anatomic PA disease, and this is actually not from our patient, although the angios look remarkably similar, um, perhaps it's possible just to support the RV and not have to bypass the pulmonary vasculature. Um, however, as you can see from the histio, um, patholo histiopathology of this patient with advanced pulmonary vascular disease, once these patients develop these complex vascular lesions with plexiform lesions, angiomatosis, sometimes even pseudoaneurysms, simply support, supporting the right ventricle with an RVAD has classically been thought to lead to pulmonary hemorrhage by sort of force feeding um, this abnormal vasculature. So support MCS strategies for those patients typically require that you bypass the pulmonary vasculature. And as everyone on this call will know, um, that we have particular challenges in our pediatric patients, although um, survival on the wait, so this is survival to transplant the wait list. And as you can see, the green bar are those patients who are successfully translated, uh, transplanted. Um, this is from the most recent 2019 um, report. Um, we have unfortunately higher rates of death on the waiting list or removal from the wait list. And most of these patients um, unfortunately do go on to pass compared with the adults. Um, and part of the issue there, this is looking at months to lung transplants in adult patient uh, stratified by their LAS at time of listing or lung allocation score. And you can see for those patients with the highest allocation scores, so those 50 to 100 that are shown in the green X's at bottom, they pretty reliably have a wait list time of zero to two months in the adult population. This can be true for our, patient, our adolescent size patients um, who similarly get the LAS score, but certainly as we get into the younger groups of patients, it can be much more difficult to predict the waitlist time. And as we think about sort of the duration of mechanical support, many of the, these devices and strategies are more um, acceptable in a temporary configuration. And so it does sort of challenge our decision-making when, when we don't have a crystal ball to know exactly how long our patient will be waiting for lungs. So with those caveats in mind, the sort of bridge to transplant strategies um, that are available for the right ventricle include ECMO, which we're all familiar with, I'll go into that more in a bit, um, PLAD or uh, pulmonary artery to LA devices. This is a paracorporeal pumpless system. And then different types of VADs, the sort of more durable VADs or temporary VADs, which of course I'll go into as well. So starting first with ECMO, I think this is kind of what we're most familiar with, all of us um, taking care of these types of patients. And for a long time, um, it was really the only support strategy for the right ventricle. We use it a lot in kind of emergency situations to stabilize patients. And it's an excellent strategy to use as a bridge. We use it often as a bridge to decision. In the PH world, we sometimes use in new diagnoses as a bridge to ramp up our treatments, um, where hopefully patients can then be decannulated. Certainly sometimes as a bridge to transplant, I'll talk more about that in a minute, or as a bridge to a more durable device. I think the caution that we want to have, especially with known patients who don't present crashing and burning, is we don't want ECMO to be used as a bridge to nowhere, right? If a patient doesn't have a good exit strategy, if they're not going to be a transplant candidate on ECMO, it's really not an appropriate use of resources or fair to the family or patient to put them through this type of support. Interestingly, and this is data from including adult data, um, the use of ECMO as a bridge to transplant is actually growing. So the graph here is a little bit confusing to read, but if you'll follow with me, the blue line here is the use of ECMO pre-transplant through the years, and it correlates with the Y-axis percentages on the left. So these ECMO in 2019 was used in about 25% of patients as a bridge to transplant. And that contrast was sort of decreasing use of the ventilator as a bridge to transplant strategy. Um, still the majority of patients patients in green and best correlates to this uh, y-axis on the right side are not on any type of life support as they termed it in this paper prior to transplant, but its use is growing. 
And actually, although patients who are supported with either mechanical ventilation or ECMO do have higher in-hospital mortality compared to those requiring no life support, their one and five year uh, survival outcomes are really no different. So perhaps it's a strategy we should be using, but there are several considerations we need to make. As everyone who works with patients in lung transplant knows, rehabilitation is really key. And so kind of the old style of ECMO where a patient is immobilized with a percutaneous cannulation in bed, unable to move deeply sedated for days or weeks before transplant is really not a model that's gonna work well for our patients. So there's several strategies that have been employed. This is from Matt Bichetta um, and his group initially published out of um, Columbia and now he's at Vanderbilt. And he actually presented this an ISHLT webinar um, about a year ago. Um, so he has what they term the sport model of um, ECMO cannulation, where he uses chimney grass to stabilize uh, the cannulation of, on VA ECMO. Um, and this allows patients to ambulate um, but obviously this is more conducive to adult patients with larger size vessels um, and also who are going to be more cooperative with commands. He also has a non-central uh, strategy that they've described where they use um, more peripheral cannulation strategies, but it's the same concept. Um, in more relevant to pediatrics, uh, the group at Texas Children's uh, and this paper, I understand is in press now uh, from Dr. Coleman, um, have successfully supported some infants and one toddler with a central VA ECMO strategy. And you can see the cannulation here, but with the stable cannula coming out utilizing Berlin cannulas. And these patients have diseases that were previously thought to be kind of universally fatal given the waitlist time. So patients with significant P VOD, surfactant deficiency um, that would not be able to survive. And he's been able, he and the team there at Texas have been able to support these patients. And um, I just saw him give a talk a little over a month ago where he showed a video of one of these patients sitting up and eating. So they're able to be extubated, rehabilitating, et cetera. And you can see relatively long durations of support when we think about pre-transplant bridge, uh, bridge to lung transplant. And so kind of the takeaways when we think about ECMO as a possible bridge to lung transplant, um, if you're thinking about quote unquote life support and the choices are ambulatory ECMO or mechanical ventilation, especially in kids who maybe can't be ambulated um, with a breathing tube or tracheostomy, Ambulatory ECMO may actually be a better option in terms of um, rehabilitating them, but it requires really a strong programmatic approach and a lot of interdisciplinary work. VV ECMO is a great option for patients with just lung disease, but in patients like ours and those with RV failure, it's really not gonna be adequate. So really mild pH or exclusive lung disease, sure, VV. Um, and obviously ambulatory VV ECMO is sort of very well established now. VA ECMO maybe is a short-term bridge to durable support, as I said, but really ambulatory VA ECMO is sort of an emerging area of our field. It can be done, but it really requires multidisciplinary involvement. CT surgery, the ICU, perfusionists, nursing, PT, OT, and psych too, especially for our patients as they're learning to kind of cope with this technology dependence. And really there are still a lot of risks involved with this. So informed consent is a key part of this process. And unfortunately, as well, this will be a theme throughout the talk, there's no, no one stops shopping. Um, there's gonna be different cannulation strategies and cannula sizes per age and size of the patient. And finally, a, a word of caution, I would say this applies again to all MCS, really beware of bleeding diathesis. We in our group have um, been increasingly aware of the risk of acquired von Willenbrand disease in our patients with severe pH, um, and it's coming up in other populations as well. And this has certainly changed some of our anticoagulation strategies um, for our patients. So just kind of a note of caution there. Okay, so moving on to some of the other, to other uh, strategies, um, I talked about the paracorporeal support devices, and here I've divided into kids and adults, and you'll see why. So when I talk about PLAD, I mean the PA to LA device. This used to be available in kind of one package under the Novolong, although that's not available in the United States, um, but you can sort of make a Frankenstein uh, Novolung by using uh, Berlin cannula, graph, uh, hemischill grafts, and then a quadrox, either a PD or adults uh, quadrox, depending on your patient. 
this was now this was reported now uh, quite a bit ago in 2016 uh, by the group in St. Louis that they uh, supported some infant a case series of infants um, with with this type of device. So you can see the cannulation strategy there um, from the right atrium and returning to the pulmonary artery. And you can see this patient here lying in bed. Again, it allows for extubation and rehabilitation. So it has some of those same benefits. It is pumpless. So it requires that your right ventricle um, is able to function. Unfortunately, in this small case series that they published um, of the four patients, three of them had pretty significant um, neurologic sequelae due to either embolic or hemorrhagic strokes. I will note that in talking with um, Dr. Sadi about this series, this was in the kind of pre bivalve rudin era. Um, so perhaps um, there are opportunities for better anticoagulation uh, strategies now, but they did bridge one patient successfully. Now, if you contrast that to um, the adult experience, um, there's quite a bit more enthusiasm. And some of you will know that in particular, the Toronto group does quite a bit of bridging um, with PLAD uh, to lung transplant in adults. Um, these authors did a review of all the case series that are published, and that's really all that's out there. And you can see of all the bridging uh, that was done to ECMO, um, excuse me, to lung transplant, um, there were 15 PA to LAs with a reasonable uh, success rate of bridging to transplant. So they didn't separate out the PA to LA in this uh, paper. Um, and also, frankly, a reasonable, given how ill these patients are, um, a reasonable percentage of patients who were able to be discharged to the hospital. So why not use this kind of all the time in our patients? Well, one is again, remember, we don't have that kind of well-defined duration of bridge to transplant support in our pediatric patients. So the longer duration of support means that the kind of accumulation of complications is more likely to happen. It's beyond the scope of this talk, but anticoagulation for multiple reasons for both ECMO and MCS um, strategies is more complex in um, pediatrics than adults. And that um, kind of lends itself to more complications um, in particular neurologic complications. And then the other thing is that you really have to have an RV that's functional. And many of you know that it's not always straightforward to distinguish between a right ventricle that's struggling and you offload it with this type of pump. Now, um, in kind of the lab circumstances, the delta across this membrane is about 15. So you would think that a right ventricle that's struggling, pumping to pulmonary hypertensive lungs or lungs with multiple stenoses, as we saw in our case, that this right ventricle would do great and is much happier. But of course, with long duration of support, that perfect lab condition probably is no longer the case. And um, again, talking uh, with Dr. Eggstadi about his experience, he saw sort of insidious right ventricular failure in many of these patients and had to convert them um, to, to better strategies. So I'm not sure that this is quite ready for prime time in all of our patients, but maybe in select adolescents where we know they may have a short duration of support or if we're really confident about their RV. Okay, so now let's speak about VADs. And, and again, I'm, I'm speaking really about our VADs. I think as we get into the discussion, we'll, we'll see that perhaps this patient would not be well served by an RVAD, but just to round out the conversation. And again, want to emphasize this point that you really have to know what type of pulmonary vasculature you're pumping to with your RVAD. And here I've dichotomized it, but those of us who take care of patients with MAFCAs know that it's really not that clean of a dichotomization, right? Some of these patients, especially depending on how long standing their disease is, can have really mixed disease where some segments of the lung are simply sort of hypoplastic pulmonary arteries or they have anatomic stenoses, but some of them really have advanced pulmonary vascular disease in the segments that have been unprotected by stenosis. And so, you know, really being thoughtful about what type of lung disease you're dealing with down to the parenchymal level uh, and vascular level. Um, so RVAD in pediatrics, unfortunately, there's really quite scarce data. This is from the PDMAX uh, registry data published um, now almost a decade ago, but even though they had 200 total patients that were supported with VADs of some type, only four of those patients were supported with RVADs. So really hard to draw any conclusions from that. More recent paper, um, again, out of the Texas group, um, talking about temporary, uh, temporary VAD support, which we'll get into more in a bit, 
um, again, quite a number of devices, only five of which are 4% were RVADs, um, and then some more BIVADs. So really uh, hard to draw kind of sweeping conclusions um, about what to do from big registries that were used to that struggle in pediatrics. Um, so people have been clever about sort of what to do. There are um, kind of durable or surgical RVAD options. Um, this was a report that um, Erica Rosenzweig uh, published. This was with Matt Bichetta as well, where they sort of cleverly refashioned a HeartMate 3, traditionally used for LVAD support, into the RVAD position. This actually, interestingly, uh, was a patient with pulmonary uh, hypertension. And so they described a slow ramp up in RVAD flow um, in order to protect the pulmonary vasculature from hemorrhage. Um, unfortunately, this patient ultimately succumbed to sepsis, um, but it was sort of a clever strategy that they published. That's really all that I could find were sort of case reports of using that. Of course, um, in pediatrics, we more often use um, Berlin in the RVAD position, but that's more typically with BIVAD uh, support. And then um, the other part is kind of temporary RVAD support. Um, this is more commonly used. So this is an Impella RP. This is a, an axial pump where the system is totally enclosed there. It can be percutaneously inserted. Um, and then there's these other systems with a protect dua cannula um, or other types of cannula where there's a centrifugal pump outside the body. Um, the main issues here are that these are designed for adults and so really can only be used in older children. And so here you see, this is the biggest case series I could find of Impella use. Um, and it's really in adolescence. The youngest patient here was 14. The smallest BSA was 1.4. Um, although they were able to successfully support these patients, it's, their use in pediatrics is limited. And then, you know, what about the patients who need also an oxygenator? Well, if you have this type of RVAD system where the pump is outside the body, it's easy to splice in an oxygenator into these devices. Um, and then finally, want to leave you with an area of some promise, um, although it's not quite ready for prime time. This is really interesting data. Again, Matt Bacchetta um, is the investigator here, he had a sheet model of pulmonary hypertension and RV failure, different configurations, but um, given that we're running long on time, I'll just show you what he did was having an RVAD and an oxygenator in the RA to LA return position had the most favorable echo characteristics where the sort of RV, um, LV relationship was preserved. As you imagine, especially if you have long-term support, you want to have that LV not get deconditioned as it could with ECMO support where the LVs bypassed. They also had the lowest pump speeds and uh, pressure gradients in order to achieve three liters of flow and the lowest uh, vaso uh, vasoactive inotrope score to support those animals. So in conclusion, um, there's lots of choices for um, MCS in the right ventricle and no clear winner. I think right now the message is that whatever your institution does well, you should probably keep doing um, because we all sort of learn our niches. For adolescents, there are many more options than for young children, but perhaps um, the central ECMO strategy that uh, the Texas group is using is something we can learn from. This is really a collaborative sport that requires our our surgeons, our ICU team, and all the other multidisciplinary care, and ultimately partnership with medical device companies to develop appropriate devices for our patients. Thank you. Well, thank you for the fabulous talk. Um, that was really great. Um, I'll move along to our, our next speaker um, is Dr. Mark Schechter. Um, so uh, Dr. Schechter, he attended uh, medical school at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. He subsequently completed both his pediatric residency and pediatric pulmonary uh, medicine fellowship at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Um, Dr. Schechter joined, then joined the faculty at Baylor College of Medicine, where he served as um, both the uh, director of the pediatric pulmonary fellowship program and the medical director of the um, lung transplant program. Um, and he subsequently has um, been recruited both to um, uh, Cincinnati Children's as well as um, currently uh, University of Florida Health Chan's Children's Hospital, and where he is the um, director of the Pediatric Lung Transplant Program. Um, so thank you for joining us, Dr. Schechter. We're really excited to hear your thoughts on decision making in heart versus um, heart lung versus lung. Thank you, thank you Kyle. Uh, hopefully you can see. 
those slides. Um, so I took the liberty to add versus lung suggest to pulmonologist to decide about how you decide between heart versus heart lung. Um, so this is obviously a um, challenging. Um, these are all challenging cases. Um, as you'll see, we do a lot of case by case determination around these cases because it's they're such small numbers. So how to go about how do we make these decisions? Well, I figure I would talk a little bit about, you know, what we hear and what most places probably do in their evaluation pathways, where we can collaborate amongst the heart and lung transplant teams, um, which we probably already do already, but just emphasizing those aspects. And then I'm really going to go through sort of the published um, selection criteria for lung alone, heart alone, and heart lung candidates. And in kids, there isn't very much, um, but there was a um, document that came out from the ISHLT recently uh, on heart lung candidates, which I think summarizes nicely. How do we choose which uh, aspects, at what does what that trigger that we go from only needing one organ to two organs? And, and that's always a hard decision and it's not clear cut. So really the question is, how are we getting from the heart teams and the lung teams to saying, you know what, we need to get together because this is what the patient does. And so <clears throat> this is a pretty simplistic um, transplant uh, pathway that probably all of us use. We all get referrals. They either come through one of the two teams, the heart or the lung transplant programs. And as you're reviewing the records that you get on these patients, or seeing these patients in your hospital, you know, I think that's really a point in time where the primary transplant team needs to look and say, is it possible that this kid would benefit from multi-organ transplant? And I think that collaboration and starting the process early in that discussion is actually quite key, especially when you're talking about approaching families about what may need to be done, what the next steps may be, where we might be headed. Um, I think the earlier on, the better for all potential people and teams being, needing to be involved is important. We obviously go through the evaluation, we get our labs, we do our echoes, EKGs, and cardiac casts. And from the lung point of view, especially in kids um, and doing this over the last decade and a half, we didn't always get cardiac casts in our patients to look for pulmonary hypertension. Um, but I think as we're doing it more and more, we're finding that there are plenty of these patients who typically don't need uh, any lung, any heart transplants, but they do actually have some uh, pulmonary hypertension that we should address and probably will impact our outcomes. And then obviously, I think one of the other places that we really have to collaborate is around this medical review board. You know, every institution has different medical review boards for each of their organs. And when you start getting into this question of multi-organ transplant, do you present each of the cases to the heart transplant and to the lung transplant MRBs, or should you have one where everything's combined? And I think that's another element that I won't give, um, I think everyone should just give uh, thought to as we're thinking about these cases is how do we get everybody in a room and how should we make these difficult decisions sometimes as we're getting through to transplant? So the ISLT has had several renditions of guidance documents on transplant uh, candidate selection. And in lung transplant alone, <clears throat> in 2015, they came out with these kind of high points. And I, they're all still relevant today. And the new rendition that came out in 21 or 22 um, sort of just evolve some uh, expert consensus statements around this, right? So we all do this. Um, and so I just think it's important to reiterate. So we're looking for patients that have end-stage disease, that have a poor quality of life and that low prospect of prolonged survival. And so they have this high risk of death, but everyone decides that there's nothing left medical or surgical to, uh, uh, options for these patients and therefore transplant may be important. Now we're all starting to focus a lot more uh, on the back end of this. And that is, is that really we're looking for candidates that we feel will have a very high likelihood of five-year survival. 
right? And as well as having near normal life. And that five year survival, at least in the United States, with the new uh, continuous uh, um, allocation scoring system that's coming for lungs is moving uh, that sur uh, post transplant survival looking at a longer period of time than just one year. So these are kind of what guide us in lung transplant, and I'm sure they guide on the heart on the heart transplant side as well. <clears throat> in pediatric lung transplant, you can see that while CF uh, still is the majority of the transplants being done, these patients with pulmonary vascular disease, as described by the case today, still make up a significant amount of uh, the pediatric lung transplants that we see. And then when you throw in the pulmonary hypertension, it is actually quite a large percentage that we see as well. And there's a small subset of these patients that probably or may benefit from heart lung rather than just lung alone. But we know the data supports that in many of these kids with pulmonary vascular disease, lung alone uh, leads to good outcomes. So when we look at these specifically pulmonary vascular diseases, when we're looking at this, you know, these are the kind of clinical things that we're looking at from referring physicians as far as when to refer, that they have class three, class four symptoms, that even when they're escalating uh, therapies, that they're having rapidly progressive disease, or they have very specific diseases such as PBOD or PCH. As they go through the transplant process, the, the requirements for listing are slightly different where we want to make sure that they've had at least a three-month um, trial of uh, multi-drug therapy uh, to see if that's helped. Obviously, in some of these pulmonary vascular diseases, um, medication therapy may not be indicated, such as in PVOD. Um, and that we're also looking at their cardiac index, their right atrial pressures, six-minute walk tests, and whether or not they have other clinical um, symptoms of uh, progressive right heart failure and things like that. <clears throat> With that right heart failure, and we talk about lung versus heart lung, um, we also know that there is good data out there that shows that when you transplant patients uh, with some right heart failure with lungs alone, that over time, um, the right heart will recover um, and may have a full recovery within six to 12 months. That being said, when we look at transplanting these kids with pulmonary vascular disease, you can see that the different eras, we've seen this very, of a significant decline in how, what transplant procedure they're going on. Prior to 2000, you can see that most of these kids were having heart lung transplants performed, where in the last decade, only 20% of those patients are actually undergoing lung transplant, or I mean, heart lung transplant. Well, while that's changed, has it really changed their outcomes? And when you see with these patients um, with pulmonary vascular disease, that actually the one-year and five-year outcomes are quite similar to, um, between uh, lung transplant alone or heart lung transplant uh, that's been performed in them. So that's the lung side of things. On the heart side of things, which is... Um, coming from the pulmonologist here, is that, you know, the indications um, are been a lot of consensus. Um, there's a lot of listing here of the different types of patients, where they are in their heart failure, what their, um, what they have con congenital heart disease, um, and a variety of things that you all use as to which kids need heart transplants. Um, and so as a pulmonologist, I won't go through all of those things, um, but you guys are familiar with those ideas. And most of these actually can go through with heart transplant alone without requiring uh, a heart-lung transplant. And so as we get through the heart and the lung aspects here, then the question is, is what are those small sets of populations that actually need both organs? And so in 2021, it became that the um, consensus from ISCHLT basically said that patients with advanced cardiac and lung disease not amenable to either isolated heart or lung transplant should undergo or be considered for heart lung transplantation. And so you're talking about patients that have irreversible myocardial dysfunction with intrinsic lung disease and or severe pulmonary hypertension, 
that they have congenital defects that are irreparable um, of the valves and chambers that also have intrinsic lung disease or severe pH. And that the few idea, the few um, measurements that we have that are relative contraindications to heart transplant alone include pulmonary hypertension that have an elevated uh, pulmonary vascular resistance of greater than five wood units uh, or an index greater than six, or their transpulmonary pressures are in the 16 to 20 range. And those all show that there's an increased risk of heart failure post-transplant and early death when those things uh, exist, plus you have elevated pulmonary artery pressures. And again, when we talked about pulmonary arterial uh, hypertension and right heart failure, again, as I said before, there are studies that show that lung transplant alone has comparable or better outcomes than the heart lung transplant um, itself. But importantly, on the adult side, they talk about needing to evaluate for infarcts or other fibrotic changes of the right ventricle, which may change uh, the risk benefit of lung alone versus heart lung. And finally, there's uh, they also make comment and recommendations that patients who actually have intrinsic cardiac disease, and you'll see that much of this is related to the adults, is that <clears throat> Doing a lung transplant alone with corrective cardiac surgery has been um, has been reported. Um, it has also been reported in um, in some kids and and univocalizations as well. Obviously, if you have sarcoid, that's a, and you have involvement of both organs, then heart lung transplant seems to be uh, the path to go. And then in the congenital heart disease with RV failure on maximal therapy and those cardiac index less than two and a right atrial pressure greater than 15, you should really think about moving forward with heart-lung transplant as well. And then if you have uh, pulmonary vein venous stenosis and PVOD and heart failure, that considering uh, moving towards that is important, uh, heart-lung transplant is important as well. But they also point out that we need to be limiting where these or where these transplants are performed, meaning that you need expertise on the lung side in kids as well as the heart side in kids um, to really be successful when you're making a decision about undergoing heart uh, lung transplant or multi-organ transplants. And that really that you should meet criteria for both, that you should have a reason for needing lungs and reason for needing heart. Um, to <clears throat> proceed with the idea of heart-lung transplant. And so that's where going to the MRBs um, might be something where you actually want to present each case individually or together so that you make sure that you feel that all teams involved believe that this is um, multi-organ transplant is the direction to go. So back to that initial slide, how do you get from one organ to the other two organs? These are some of the things that we, were mentioned by me, um, but they're very variable and they vary amongst uh, um, different um, centers as well. Um, I can tell you here at UF, for example, the age and the size of the patient comes into play. Our surgeons um, <clears throat> have some concerns about small anastomosis and doing lungs alone in some of our infants. Um, uh, historically, um, they've had concerns about that. Um, I know in Texas Children's, they probably would proceed with lungs alone. So there are a variety of things, but these are the kind of the different things that should go into your decision making when you're looking if you could get away with heart and lung alone or if you need to undergo heart lung transplant. So um, there is a small group of patients with these pulmonary vascular diseases and congenital heart disease that may benefit from heart lung over single organ transplant. Um, there's limited data, but some ex expert consensus about which patients may benefit, as I described. And really, the biggest thing about the decision making between which is is really about the multidisciplinary collaborative approach between both teams, so that on these difficult case by case basis, we can do what we think is best for the patient and the family. And right, I thank you. Oh, Carol, I think you're still muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks, Mark, for for that 
delicious <laughs> uh, presentation. And now we're moving on to Mike Ma, who is an assistant professor of cardiac cardiothoracic surgery in the Division of Pediatric Cardiac Surgery here at Stanford University. His practice entails all aspects of congenital heart disease with an emphasis on neonates, complex biventricular repair, and pulmonary artery reconstruction and heart failure. His translational research lab uses, utilizes biomechanical engineering principles to optimize existing and de develop de novo surgical and endovascular therapies in the ongoing treatment of complex heart defeat defects. He is the surgical director for the complex biventricular reconstruction and pediatric advanced cardiac therapies programs. Take it away, Mike. Okay. You guys hear me okay? And the slides are in the right view? I think all set? so. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I think we have nine minutes left for the entire webinar, so I'm going to try to blow through this quickly because a lot of it's a bit repetitive. Uh, thank you for the very nice and flattering introduction. Um, this talk was originally handed to me as transplantation after PA reconstruction. I retitled it as transplantation with PA reconstruction, and you'll see why in a few minutes. And I'm really excited because Melody's presentation in the beginning of this entire session is perfect for this discussion. Uh, I have no disclosures to make other than I'm very excited to be with you guys here this morning. So uh, the case that I'm gonna talk about is something that we tackled about three years ago now. This is a 29 kilo, 10 year old who had bad RV dysfunction, a history of tent mapcas that was repaired uh, with a fenestrated VSD closure and a conduit. Uh, this patient was referred to our center for a variety of possible treatment pathways. Uh, we performed some um, pre-operative or pre-procedural studies that included a cath and the MRI and echo, as you see here. The RV pressure is quite high. There's biatrial uh, elevated filling pressures. There, there's distal PA pressure that is enticing for some type of repair at 22 to 27. Uh, with a calculated PVR across the pulmonary circuit of between three and seven and a half wood units, depending on if you were going to plug something into the MPA itself or if you were going to try to salvage the distal pulmonary artery vessels. The patient uh, had a very blown out RV with an index volume of about 400, ejection fraction on the right side of 15%, and very severe tricuspid regurgitation. This is a representative echo. I'm sorry, it's a little slow on my computer, but you can see that the RV is blown out. And then on this second panel, you can see the significant amount of tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, this is a few representative angiograms of this patient's pulmonary artery tree at this time. Uh, as you can see, this is a selective angiogram into the right pulmonary artery tree. There is a very hypertensive proximal RPA with pretty good distal targets, but far out into the lobar and segmental vessels. This is a lateral shot of the same pulmonary arteries. You can see those lobar branches into the lower lobe are both quite stenotic for a centimeter or two. And then obviously this patient had received some pulmonary artery stenting already done to try to improve the proximal PAs and the distal left pulmonary artery actually looks somewhat favorable. I'm not gonna spend the time to go through all the angiograms on the left side, but suffice to say that there were pretty good targets to the left pulmonary artery after the main LPA into the lobar branches of the LPA. So what next? This is the same question I think Melody asked for a very similar patient in the beginning. What would you all do at your centers with this patient? Right, so we thought this case was very high risk. So we didn't really wanna go in and do some crazy reconstruction. So we first listed the patient for heart lung. Patient really didn't do very well, was struggling on the floor with ongoing RV dysfunction, requiring low dose inotropic support. Uh, we waited five months like this without an appropriate donor. So it got us a little more desperate into thinking about what else we might really reconsider. We know heart-lung outcomes are 
not the greatest in the world and our whole group is trying very hard to improve on that but five ten year data is less than 50 percent survival across all cohorts this is a very recent analysis of a UNOS data set and so we thought well you know we're also pretty good at heart transplant uh, the outcomes for isolated heart transplant is a lot better and we're also pretty good at pulmonary artery reconstruction, uh, which is this slide here showing our isolated non-transplant PA reconstruction cohort of about 150 patients in 20 years. And we're pretty good at getting the systemic RV pressure down to less than half systemic. Um, but we were kind of loath to try to do an isolated PA reconstruction at a patient with massive RV dysfunction. So we thought of perhaps combining the two procedures. So we tried our very first simultaneous extensive pulmonary artery reconstruction with replacement of the heart in hopes that we would get a heart into a patient with a low enough PVR. This was reported maybe in 2021 in JHLT as a case report. I think we've done one or two more cases since then. So we have a, we almost have an entire case series now, but um, the procedure itself requires a lot of orchestration like all transplants do more than most, I would say, because there's so much reconstruction to be done on the pulmonary arteries prior to the organ arriving. We had to make sure that we had enough time to do as much of the PA work as possible before we brought the donor heart back to the field. So this required a lot of communication on the behalf of a lot of people. And then the procedure itself, we did our sort of standard extensive PA reconstruction, which involves uh, isolating the branch PAs. And then in this case, we're able to take out the donor heart, which made the PA reconstruction a lot easier because there was no heart in the way. And we were able to do an extensive reconstruction like we usually do, which involves splicing open the PA, opening up each of the lobar and segmental stenoses and then reconstructing those in a native to native fashion to improve the pulmonary blood flow. And then patching the main axial branch P on each side and putting it all together uh, with the donor heart being put back in place. So this is, these are the interoperative photos of that first case that we did. As you can see in panel A, there's no heart there now, so it makes the branch PAs much easier to work with. We were able to split that in panel B and do the PA reconstruction, and then we were able to implant the donor heart back in after we had done the reconstruction. This panel D is a post-operative cath showing improvement in the various low bar and segmental stenoses in the vessels. So our early result from this patient, we uh, had mild biventricular dysfunction coming off bypass good low filling pressures on both sides, less than half systemic RV pressure. We weaned inotropes by post-op day six. The patient was home at post-op day 23. That patient has been followed out for about two and a half years now. There's good bi-V function in the donor allograft. The RVSP by a TRJ is 25 plus the right atrial pressure. Uh, we, we have surveillance capped this patient about three or four months ago. At the time, the RV pressure was about 35, 40% systemic. And we also did a lung perfusion scan with good flow to both lungs. So I think this is a good uh, initial experience and alternative for the case that was presented in the beginning. Uh, I think it's really important to have comfort with both isolated uh, procedures before you attempt a simultaneous procedure. Uh, there needs to be a lot of communication between various members of the team to allow the logistics for a procedure like this to happen. We, we know that all transplants are very time sensitive on the day we go out for the recovery. Uh, so we need to give ourselves extra buffer if we're gonna perform an extensive reconstruction like this. And we've had pretty good results now with two or three patients using this methodology. So with that, ah, we're at time, but I open up for any questions or comments. Perfect. Well, thank you for the for the run through. That was that was excellent. Um, you know, I think before, um, why don't we just open it up to the to the group? You know, we had some excellent speakers today with really wonderful talks. Um, any um, any comments? Uh, maybe um, Julia, is it okay if we take five minutes for for comments and questions?
Right, she says yes. Hi, Dr. Ma, this is Tina Melikov from TCH, uh, lung transplant. Um, part, is part of the logistic, that, that seems complex, and um, I think we've been there. Do you request um, postponing cross clamp uh, or clamping on the donor like for an hour or two? Like, how do you calculate how long uh, you're going to take to repair and to avoid prolonged ischemic time on the heart? Or do you pump the heart, the donor heart? Yeah, I think there's two strategies there. You either have to have a really good donor that you feel like there's a low likelihood you're going to abort, and then you take the recipient to the OR well in advance so that you could start the reconstruction and almost take a leap of faith that you don't need to visualize the donor and say, look, we're going to take okay. this no matter what. The kid is sick enough. We're willing to take a chance. The other option is to ask for as much cross clamp delay as possible. Uh, in this case, we had about a five and a half hour ischemic time on this heart, which probably explains why the biventricular dysfunction was a little bit worse than we expected. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think you need to consider all those factors when you're doing this. I, I think I think the other thing we're going to think about doing is doing at least the left pulmonary artery because that's much harder to do with the heart mass in place. The right pulmonary artery, you could probably do the reconstruction after you start reperfusing. So that would be another strategy I would consider in a future simultaneous case. Thank you. Um, so Mike, do you think that that case would be amenable to PA reconstruction, even though there's all those stents present? Yeah, it's not ideal. We, we hate peripheral stents for the pulmonary arteries, obviously, but, uh, the, the quick views I got of Melly's case, I thought the distal PA targets were pretty reasonable. So that's certainly something I would offer a patient. Like, I don't know what ended up happening to that patient. Did you guys end up trying that or did you do a heart lung or? She actually ended up um, not being a candidate for um, any transplant just uh, due to getting worse and she ended up going home on hospice. Got it. But yeah, yes. I think that's the kind of kid that we would try something like this on. You know, the other idea would be if you think the RV is marginal, do the reconstruction and then and then maybe put in a temporary device and see if you can wean the RV support over some time. We, we haven't done that yet, you know, par vad, but that's that certainly would be on the table, like a bridge to recovery sort of RV situation. If, it, if we don't think the RV is going to handle the long bypass run of the PA reconstruction. Um, but. We haven't found an exact candidate for that procedure yet. And to you know, to Rebecca, I mean, you you had some really nice options there in terms of potential mechanical supports for a lot of um, potential scenarios. And one one thing that jumped out to me was um, you, you had mentioned there's that threshold for um, RVAD support versus um, just bypassing the. The pulmonary vascular but do you have a, a threshold in your mind or is it kind of a, a gestalt taking the whole patient into, into consideration yeah not a specific threshold but i think i would worry if a patient had portions of their pulmonary vascular bed that were unprotected if the angios suggested that there were sort of pruning or things that suggest more advanced pulmonary vascular disease I would either bypass the bed or if you use an RVAD strategy, really do the kind of slow ramp up that um, Erica Rosenzweig and her colleagues described where you're being cautious that you're not inducing pulmonary hemorrhage and have a bailout. No, oh, thank you. Well, I think uh, we're over time and I appreciate everybody for sticking around. Um, and uh, please feel free to get a hold of us or Drs. Ma or Kamini or Schechter about any questions you might have in the future.
Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And just a reminder um, uh, that the webinar um, will have a post webinar survey and that's going to be sent out via email and we'll have the uh, posting of the recording on the ISHLT uh, YouTube um, in just a little bit. Well, thanks again to our wonderful speakers. Um, I learned a lot. And this was a great discussion and um, some really exciting um, um, options going forward for this really challenging population. Yes, uh, this was a really great discussion and presentation. Thank you all very much.